Friends, welcome to worship for Sunday, August 9th, 2020. The weather this past week has been absolutely lovely here in northern Wisconsin with cool breezes and mild temperatures, but summer isn't over yet, and the heat is returning along with the humidity. But even with the warmer weather, we still have fabulous sunrises and sunsets, longer nights with beautiful starry skies, and the opportunity to see God's presence and beauty just about everywhere we turn. We continue to live together with the challenges of COVID-19. Our scientists are working on a possible vaccine and our medical professionals are learning every day about better ways to treat it, improving outcomes and survival rates. And we are learning together how to live our lives safely and carefully with COVID as a real presence among us. It's not going away anytime soon. And so we are figuring out how to adapt how to do things together with family and friends while caring for our own and our collective health. I read a quote recently from Rich Velotas, who pastors the New Life Fellowship in Brooklyn, New York. He said, the Bible is more communal than individual. Jesus teaches us to pray our father, not my father. Paul uses the phrase our Lord 53 times and my Lord only one time. Jesus is my personal savior is not found in Holy Scripture. We are the people of God. We belong to each other. Now, perhaps more than ever in my lifetime, at least, we are seeing how incredibly important our connections to and relationships with one another are. What I do affects you and what you do affects me. More than that, it affects someone three relationships away from me, someone who may be vulnerable to infection, receiving chemo treatments, caring for a newborn, providing care for our seniors, teaching our children, and more. All of the things we are doing to prevent COVID-19 from spreading aren't necessarily about us as individuals, though I pray daily that none of us get the virus but they are about our relationships with one another, our connections to each other, our health together as the body of Christ, as occupants of planet Earth. The statewide mask mandate is in effect. Masks are required for in-person worship and all activities, meetings, ministries, and gatherings in all three of our churches. While there are people who truly cannot wear masks, that isn't true for most of us, at least not for the 45 minutes we're in worship together. And the best science available tells us that masks are an important part of preventing community spread of not only COVID-19, but other viruses as well. If you have particular concerns about the mask order or any aspect of this phase of our dealing with COVID, please reach out to me. We do have a supply of disposable masks available at each church, but we encourage you to bring and wear your reusable fabric masks. There is no doubt these are challenging days, but I know that we are up to the challenge. We will meet these days with faith, courage, and hope. We will adapt, listen to and learn from our scientists, believe in God, trust our doctors and nurses, and remember our connections to one another. I believe in us and God believes in us. Seriously, we can do this together. A few parish announcements as we begin. Our year of giving a, a focus for August is school supplies. We don't know what it's gonna look like exactly for the coming school year. Will it be virtual and online or in the classrooms or a combination of both things? COVID-19 has required teachers to get even more creative with their work. But however school happens, kids need supplies. This year, let's think of the very basic things like crayons, pencils, pens, loose leaf paper, spiral notebooks, and such. This will allow the kids to do their work either in the classrooms or in their homes. The supplies are out now, so feel free to bring them to church. If you prefer to make a cash donation, you can put it in the offering plate with checks to the church with school supplies in the memo. Supplies will be given to our local schools as well as distributed through area service organizations. The Black Creek Christian Education Board met and will be having Sunday school this year, both in person with good distancing and hygiene and take home packs for families who need them as well. 
It will all begin with Rally Day on Sunday, September 13th. There will be a lunch, but it will not be potluck. All the food will be provided and there will be games, limbo, ring toss, and Jesus bingo, plus ice cream. If you have questions, please talk with me or Robin Schmidt. The Trinity Sunday School families are still working out exactly what our plans will be for this fall. The Black Creek Women's Guild met on Wednesday and decided that in a year when nothing is like it was before, we will be serving the fall feast on Sunday, October 4th as an entirely takeout event. Order forms are being created and takeout containers acquired to allow us to serve our community as best we can while keeping ourselves and others safe. This means there will be considerable changes to how things are done in the preparation for and serving of the dinner, so please stay tuned for a lot more information in the coming weeks. As of now, the Trinity Fall Bazaar is still on for Saturday, October 10th, though there are likely to be changes to both the bake sale and the lunch, and the Cecil Potato Pancake Dinner is still on for Election Day, Tuesday, November 3rd. Speaking of elections, Wisconsin's primary election is this Tuesday, August 11th. You can confirm hours for your polling place, which are usually 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., by calling your village clerk or by visiting myvote.wi website, where you can also verify your registration and request a mail-in or absentee ballot for the November election. We are continuing to live through a major social upheaval. Protests surrounding the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, and others have spread throughout the United States and around the world. The, pro the protests have been largely peaceful, but as you know, outside forces have come and caused damage, sowing seeds of hatred, chaos, and division. At the heart of the protests are questions that ask us as individuals, as a country, and indeed as the world to deal with things that many would rather ignore. The racism and bigotry of our collective history. Our faith in Jesus demands that we face the truth of our past, the racism towards native peoples on whose land we live, blacks who were bought and sold as property, and others who were and are discriminated against based on skin color, age, gender, sexual identity, economic status, and more. Our faith also demands that we work together to listen, to hear, and to find ways to build a more just world for all God's children in every place around the world. And our faith demands that we allow no excuse or justification for racism and bigotry against anyone. It is against everything that Jesus taught and all the ways he asked us to live. We are called to love and trust and speak out against the many connected isms that destroy and dehumanize others and ourselves. My deepest hope and prayer is that this time might bring about real, meaningful change for all God's children, that we might live into the fullness of who we are and can be, united and dependent on one another as we move into the future. Thank you. You all have been incredibly generous and faithful. If you would like, you may continue to send your contributions by mail. And now we begin worship together. We begin with a time of quiet. In the midst of everything happening in our lives and in the life of the world, we pause. We remember that we are always in the presence of the holy, loved and cherished as we are. If you're comfortable doing so, take a few slow breaths, allowing your body to relax. Remember, you can trust in God's arms of grace that support you through everything that life brings. Remember that God created you knows your name, and loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And let us pray. God of all time and every place, come to us in this moment, in the different ways we are together as your people, in our sanctuaries and our homes. 
Help us to pause, to open our hands and hearts to you, to your incredible grace and your unending love. Let this time calm us and inspire us that we might live as you intend. In faith we pray. Amen. Our first hymn is All People That On Earth Do Dwell, written by William Keith. We don't know much about Keith, except that as a Protestant, he fled the 16th century reign of Catholic Queen Mary of England and found refuge in Geneva, Switzerland. There he worked with other English refugees to translate the Bible, and he produced musical settings for many of the Psalms. The only one that remains in wide circulation is this one, a version of Psalm 100, set to what is probably Keith's own tune, now known as Old Hundredth, or sometimes more commonly in our lives, the tune we sing the doxology to. The psalm and its inspiration, the song, excuse me, and its inspiration of the hundredth psalm are both reminders of God's presence in our lives and our call to celebrate God in all we do. It can be found in our New Century Hymnal at number seven.
trusting in God's grace and love, we confess our sins, knowing that God will receive us, forgive us, and inspire us in our lives as Jesus's disciples. Let us pray together. God of grace, we come today full of all kinds of complicated and confusing emotions. We confess we are tempted by the ways of this world, tempted to put our faith in money or possessions or thinking we are better than others. We confess that we are uncertain about the world we are living in, what seems to overwhelm us with heartbreak, hatred, and bitterness. We confess that we are weary of all the struggles of our own lives, of our life together, of the eternity it feels like we have been dealing with COVID and of all that weighs us down. Resurrect our hope so we can bring hope to others. Comfort our weary hearts and souls and revive our faith that we might be a beacon of your love in these complicated times. With courage, we pray in the name of Jesus, who showed us how to live in unity with you and with the world. Amen. Hear the good news. Through God's grace and in Jesus' love, we are forgiven. Go now and live as forgiven and forgiving people. Thanks be to God. We pray enjoy this week for Hannah and Hunter Hamilton from Cecil, who were married this past week for time spent carefully and safely with family and friends, for the beauty of creation we see around us each day, for the joy of family and friends gathering, gathering together, for the faith and strength of all those whose work allows us to live, for the relationships of support and connection that are coming out of our dealing with the pandemic, and for other joys you are celebrating. We pray in concern this week for the people of Beirut, Lebanon, recovering from a horrible explosion at the port, which has left more than 150 dead and many, many more injured, and for a difficult situation made even more complicated by severed supply lines. For seven Marine Corps members and one Navy member killed during a training exercise off of Southern California, their names are PFC Brian Baltiera, PFC Evan Bath, PFC Jack Ostrovsky, Corporal Wesley Rod, Lance Corporal Chase Sweetwood, Corporal Cesar Villanueva, and U.S. Navy Hospitalman Christopher Gnem. For Brad Lehman, Rita Buss, Michelle Arnold, Bridget, and all dealing with cancer. For all who have and are recovering from COVID-19, and all those who have had loved ones die from the virus. Philip Hurt from Cecil continuing to recover from his car accident. Emily, sister of Mackenzie Lehman. Lindsay Pinkley, Karen Zulager, and all who are recovering from surgery. For all who are struggling with addiction and their mental health. For teachers, school aides, administrators, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, and all who are trying to navigate the coming school year safely. For everyone who is struggling with the ongoing effects of the pandemic, the changes in routine, the uncertainty, and more. For Caitlin Kelly, age 22, member of the Menominee tribe missing from Shano since June 16th, that the voices of those demanding human rights and real justice might be heard, and that this might be a time of real and meaningful change for our country and the world towards true equality for all God's children, and for these other concerns that you are struggling with. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come today with thanksgiving and hope for all the joys of our lives. We thank you for love shared and multiplied, for friends and family, for community and for our congregations that provide us with support and encouragement as we journey through life. 
Fill us with patience and compassion as we live through these strange and challenging days. Remind us that our job is not to judge, but to tend to our own actions and behaviors, that together we might protect our own health and the health of our communities. Help us learn deep in our hearts and souls what is truly important in our lives and in the life of the world. Help us support others, remember our dependence on one another, and advocate on behalf of the health and welfare of all your children and all creation. Be with and keep safe soldiers, sailors, firefighters, police officers, first responders, emergency medical technicians, utility workers, garbage collectors, and transit drivers. Remind us of the work that farmers, farm workers, factory employees, truck drivers, postal workers, and delivery workers do for us and for the world. Remind us that the work of fighting this virus is not done, that it is still a real threat to our collective health. Be with all those who care for others in hospitals, clinics, nursing and care facilities, and child care programs. Give them strength, courage, and all the supplies they need to safely do their work. Be with those who lead and make decisions about our collective health, creating and carrying out public policy. Bring your hope to all who are struggling with worry and anxiety and the ongoing effects of the virus. Be with those who felt and still feel isolated, with those who are overwhelmed, with those who are confused and scared, with those who are frustrated, and with those for whom this is a time of renewal and hope. Be with our teachers and school staff and administration as they try to find a way to educate as safely and carefully as possible in the coming year. Help them as they balance all the things that compete for importance and give them the courage and flexibility to embrace what the future holds. Be with parents who are trying to figure out what the coming year will bring for their children's education, care, and nurture. Help us in the middle of life's storms to be joyful. Remind us of your presence in the ever-changing world for friends and family, for community, hope, and connections, for dependence on you and on one another. Help us, O oh God, to be in solidarity with those who struggle in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for Brad, Michelle, Rita, Bridget, and all who are dealing with cancer. We pray for all those who have had or still have COVID-19 and are dealing with the ongoing effects. We pray for the health of our communities and every community around the world. We pray for Philip Hurt as he continues to recover from his accident, for Karen, Lindsay, and Emily, and all who are recovering from surgery. Be with all who are in need of your healing grace. Heal their bodies if that is possible, O oh God, but surely you are able to make them whole in spirit, one with you. Be with all, O oh God, who struggle with broken and hurting relationships, with the joys and challenges of being in community, with the struggles of addiction, anxiety, and mental health. Be with the family of Caitlin Kelly as they wait for news of her whereabouts and pray she might be returned to those who love her soon and safely. Comfort all those who mourn, O oh God, with all who are struggling with grief and loss, whether that grief is new or many years old. Be particularly with the families of the young servicemen killed during training in California. Comfort them and all who grieve and remind us of your promise of life everlasting. Be with the people of Beirut, Lebanon as they sift through the debris, tend to the wounded, and attend the funerals of those who were killed in the horrible explosion. Be with all the people of Lebanon and all the refugees who shelter there, that they might find some calm in the middle of the chaos. 
B, with the families of all those who are victims of sexism, racism, discrimination, and hatred. Help us to do our part in working to challenge and end the sins of racism, white supremacy, sexism, and all the isms that divide us. Guide us and give us strength that we might open our hearts and minds and spirits to your presence, your power, and your grace. Help us that we might find the true peace and grace that can never be taken from us. These and all our prayers we entrust to God who knows us better than we know ourselves, for God created us, loves us, and claims us as God's very own. We pray all things with the words that Jesus taught his first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We fast forward through Genesis to the beginning of the story of Joseph, son of Jacob. The 11th of 12 sons will grow into one of the most important ancestors of our faith, eventually. First, he has to learn what to do with his gifts, with his brothers, and with God's timing, which is rarely our own. Reading from Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 28, adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an immigrant, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob, who is called Israel. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen. To this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brothers, saying, Look, I have had another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So Jacob said to him, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring back word to me. So he sent Joseph from the valley of Hebron, Joseph came to Shechem and found a man wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, 
and we shall see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered Joseph out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with the sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites going from Gilead, coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our own brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living of this scripture. Our reading from Genesis today features the beginning of one of my favorite parts of the ancestors and history of our faith. Joseph, son of Jacob. Joseph of the amazing, maybe technicolor, dream coat. A few weeks back, Randy thought with you about Jacob's story of being tricked into marrying Leah when it was really Rachel he loved best. That moment leads directly to today to a family of siblings who know that they are loved very differently by their father. Jacob has children with both of his wives, the sisters Leah and Rachel, and with their two servants, Bilhah and Zilpah. Between the four women, there are eventually 12 sons and one daughter. But Rachel, the deepest love of Jacob's life, bears only two of the sons, the youngest, Joseph, and Benjamin. Because he loves their mother the most, Jacob plays favorites, particularly with Joseph, and the other brothers know it. In a family of hard-working desert herders, clothes were generally very practical. But Jacob gets Joseph a fancy coat, one the scriptures tell us has sleeves. That probably sounds more than a little odd to our modern ears. Why wouldn't a coat have sleeves after all? But for the practical and difficult work a herder did, sleeves were not only unnecessary, you'd use blankets or fleeces to cover yourself if you were cold, but sleeves often get in the way, getting caught in branches and brambles when you're trying to rescue a lost sheep keeping you from moving your arms completely, making feeding and carrying, caring for the animals difficult. So here is Joseph with his fancy coat, probably as many of us have come to picture it in vibrant colors, with sleeves that would keep him from having to share in the hardest work that his brothers had to do. Benjamin, the youngest, wasn't supposed to be out in the fields yet, but it would have been expected of Joseph. And instead of that, instead of sharing in the family business, Joseph stays home, taking an interest in the work, I imagine, around the campfire, in the kitchens, what would have been seen by the other brothers as soft and simple work, although I think it was much harder than they imagined to provide for the entire clan. So Joseph grows up sheltered, and probably more than a little spoiled by his father. And it starts to wear on his brothers. Their patience runs thin at seeing him privileged and loved more than they feel they ever will be. And for his part, Joseph does not help matters. You see, Joseph has been given a gift he can interpret dreams. In those days, dream readers were an important people to have. Their work at correctly understanding and interpreting dreams could mean the difference between a plentiful harvest or losing everything in a drought, between prosperity and destruction. 
Joseph has the gift, but what he doesn't have is any sense of timing or tact. When he has a dream and knows what it means, he blurts it out without any thought of how those who hear his interpretation might feel or react. He dreams of bundles of wheat and all the stars bowing down to him to show him honor and proudly announces that this means someday his brothers and his parents will all bow before him. I'm sure that went really well. For the nearly youngest son to go on and on about how his older brothers, the ones who work hard in the fields all day while he lounges around the tent in his fancy clothes, how they will bow before him and pay him homage. The brothers are understandably, I think, hurt and angry with Joseph and his arrogance at thinking they are that he is better than they are. Their father, Jacob, though, knows that dreams are something special. So he makes a mental note of what Joseph says, even while cautioning him to be careful interpreting his dreams so freely. Time passes, and the spoiling of Joseph goes on until one day their father sends him out into the fields to check on his brothers. Jacob dresses Joseph in his fine and fancy coat and sends him out to see if they're doing the work they're supposed to be doing or if they're just loafing around. I always imagine Joseph dressed in his fancy multicolored coat with sleeves going out into the desert with quite a little spring in his step knowing he's going to be the overseer, the one who reports back to their father about what his brothers are doing, feeling kind of jaunty at being a bit of a snitch. He finds them eventually at a place called Dothan and they see him before he sees them. The sight of Joseph crossing over the last hill in his fancy coat makes their blood boil. They just can't stand it anymore. And they plot to kill him, to rid themselves of their little brother and pass his death off as an accident, planning to tell their father that he was killed by a wild animal. When he gets to their camp, the brothers seize Joseph and throw him into a nearby pit, a deep, empty hole in the earth that he could never climb out of on his own, one that the scriptures are careful to tell us doesn't have any water in it. And then having at least temporarily gotten rid of Joseph, the brothers sit down to a nice meal, no doubt hearing his screams and pleas for help while they break bread. While they're eating, they watch as a group of traders go by, bound for Egypt, the most powerful nation at that time. And the brothers have an idea. Why not make a little money off the annoying upstart? Why not sell him into slavery? They'd be rid of him. They'll line their pockets, and they know that someone as soft and gentle as little Joseph will never make it long in slavery. He will surely die from the hard work, but at least he won't have died by their own hands. So they pull him up out of the pit, sell him to the traders, and return to their father thinking they will never see him again. But Joseph's story doesn't end with being pulled out of the pit and traveling away to slavery in Egypt. His story goes on through the closing chapters of Genesis to find him enslaved and jailed, and eventually the second most powerful man in Egypt married with two children and overseeing all the lands and grain and stock for the Pharaoh, having used his skills in dream interpretation finally with some finesse and tact to help get Egypt through a powerful season of drought and famine. And those skills, the one that he uses to move beyond merely being a slave in the house of Pharaoh's steward, are what enables him to save his family. The drought, of course, doesn't care about nation and property boundaries, and so it spreads to Canaan, where Benjamin has grown into a man, and where the rest of his brothers are living with the memory of having sold their brother, watching their father continue day after day in unrelenting grief, believing Joseph to be dead. The drought spreads, and Jacob and his family hear that there is grain that can be bought in Egypt, 
so the brothers make the trip to buy from the manager of Pharaoh's stores, not knowing who he is, not recognizing their little brother after so many years, not ever imagining that he could still be alive. It will take two trips and two private meetings with his brothers before Joseph can reveal his true identity. And when he finally does, he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. The family will survive the drought, will settle in the land of Egypt, and that, of course, will lead to all kinds of problems later on when a different Pharaoh rises to power and is threatened by the success and prosperity of the people of Israel, eventually enslaving them. But for now, the family is reunited, restored, because, as Joseph said, what his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. I love Joseph and his story of his maturing into his calling and understanding his gifts of dream interpretation, of finding a way to keep his faith and even prosper while living as a slave, separated from his family and having everything he knew and understood taken from him, of rising to power and using it for good to help as many people as possible, and of his eventually taking the pain he experienced at the hands of his brothers and choosing to forgive. But at the same time, I always want us to approach this story with a bit of caution. A lot of harm has been done throughout history by turning Joseph's life into a should story, of saying that the people of God should, must, and have to forgive as Joseph did. For centuries. Pastors have told the faithful that Joseph li Joseph's life is an example of the way we are to live, that in the worst moments of our lives, we have to see how God is working for good. We have to confess that something wonderful comes from all of the pits and despair in our lives. And that is simply not true. Some pits, some of our struggles, some of our desperately awful moments aren't transformative. They aren't leading to something greater, better, good, or holy. They're just awful. And all we can do is get through them as best we can. This happens, the story of Joseph becomes a should, must, have to lesson when we miss how it happens. When we forget the years of slavery that Joseph will live through, when we forget that even though he is perhaps the second most powerful man in the world, he is still technically a slave, his freedom always under control of the Pharaoh. But most importantly, it becomes a have-to story when we forget that it is Joseph who chooses to forgive, who chooses to understand what happened to him as something terrible that became something good. No one is there to tell Joseph he has to forgive his brothers. In fact, the people around him, the Pharaoh and his court, would probably have urged him to seek vengeance, to kill his brothers, or at least throw them into jail for the rest of their lives. No one got to tell Joseph that he had to forgive, that he had to seek and find God's presence in the pit and in his slavery and in all the other challenges of his life. And no one gets to tell you either. It is a wonderful act of faith to look back on what we've lived through and see how God, how and where God carried us, provided for us, held us together when we were sure we would never be able to go on. It's incredible when we can do that, when we can find God's love in the pits of our lives, in the struggles, in the darkest and scariest moments. But no one else has the right ever to tell us that we have to. That is our work and only our work if we to find if we choose to do so the spark of the divine, the movement of the holy, the grace of God in our moments of muck. The work of the church, the work of the pastor, the work of the rest of the people of God is to walk with us, or sit with us, or cry with us, or make us a sandwich while we live through it, while we sort through our feelings and thoughts, our doubts and our anger. 
The point of community is to be there for each other, not to hand each other simple answers that are never so simple and stale platitudes that so often ignore the truth and depth of what's going on. Our job, each of us in our own way, is to reflect on our lives, to entertain the possibility that God is at work in the middle of our hardest times and that somewhere there is a glimmer of hope, a teeny tiny candle flickering in a gale force wind, but still somehow lighting the way. It is our job as God's people, as descendants of Joseph, to think about where and how, and maybe even if God is present with us in the pits and prisons of our own lives. And our job is also to recognize, to pay attention to what's happening around us when our friends, our families, the members of our parish, the members of our community, and all the other people around the world are struggling through their own pits. Not telling them that God is working for good, but showing up, calling, writing, sending a text, lifting a prayer, delivering a sandwich, and being the glimmer. The little candle that someday they can look back and see was always there. These are strange and challenging times, my friends. We're living in them with COVID and the economy and the election and what feels like a constant stream of bad news from around the world before we even consider our personal struggles with health and finances and family and so much more. We could rush to find the presence of God, to somehow see in this moment God working for good that we can't even yet imagine. And if that's where you're already at, that's wonderful. But if it's not, if you're just making it through, that's okay too. What we all must do, however, is be the best little flickering, sometimes scared and shaky candle we can be offering what hope we can through our words and our actions and our lives because we never know what God can do with us for someone else, for the transforming of the pit of someone's life into a place of grace and mercy. Years after Joseph saves his family, Jacob dies, and Joseph fulfills a promise to return to Shechem and bury him there. The whole family goes in caravan, and when they're returning to Egypt, they go through Dothan and pass by the pit the brothers had thrown Joseph in so many years before. Joseph stops, and the others, sure that this is it, this is the moment when Joseph will lash out in anger at what they put him through. And I imagine that if one of the brothers had rushed up and said, hey, Joseph, I know that us throwing you into this pit was bad and everything, and yes, we expected you to die, but you know, God turned it all around. If one of them had said that, Joseph might just have turned in anger and lashed out and thrown all his brothers into that very same pit. But they didn't. They allowed Joseph to be hurt and sad and angry at all that happened and allow him to see God's presence and love on his own in his own time. And so he was able to stand by the pit, the starting point of his own struggles, and say to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. My prayer for all of us as we live through this time in our lives and in the life of the world is that we might try to not should people, but that we dig deep in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own faith and remember times when God was there, maybe through someone else's gentle and loving presence, and then offer that, that light and hope to others, so that someday we might all look back on the year that was 2020, a year when nothing was like it had been before, and find our own way to say that in the middle of the struggle, God was there, working for good. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time of worship. May each of us be renewed and strengthened by what we have heard today. May we live with a new commitment to being your children, restoring the places that are broken, building bridges, offering hope, and doing all that Jesus taught. 
inspire us that we might reach out to those who are excluded, sit with those who are struggling, rejoice with those who are celebrating, weep with those who are grieving, and love everyone as you love us, generously and abundantly. In hope we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is I'm Pressing on the Upward Way, which you might know as Higher Ground, written by Johnson Oatman Jr. in 1892. Oatman was ordained in the M.E. Zion tradition, serving now and again as a local church pastor, but primarily he worked with his father at their mercantile in New Jersey, and then as an insurance salesman. But Oatman loved music. Singing with his father and writing several thousand hymns, many of which became standards in the gospel songbooks of his day. It is set to higher ground by Charles Gabriel, composed for Oatman's words. Gabriel was an accomplished composer whose works became an important part of the Billy Sunday revivals during the beginning of the 1900s. The hymn is a plea that we might live the way God desires us to, on the higher ground of God's kingdom. It can be found in our New Century Hymnal at number 442. And now, my friends, receive this benediction. May you know the unity of our parish in all its different places and forms that guides and sustains us each day. May you know that God's love for you is real and powerful. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit give you courage and peace and hope today and in all the days to come. Amen. <laughs>